Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Lorreen Tuttle with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Warren William bringing you the story, Emeralds Come High. But first... Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Emeralds Come High. Probably one of the most interesting things in the life of a probate lawyer is the diversity of his clients. Take, for example, the strange case of Patsy Bubbles Moran, whom I have quite appropriately dubbed the daughter of Salome. Bubbles, as the world knew her, was billed from coast to coast as the queen of burlesque and she'd grown quite rich as well as notorious in her unusual calling. I'd never had the pleasure of meeting the celebrated Bubbles until she became the sole beneficiary, under the last will and testament, of an itinerant prospector named Joe Marks. Joe, it seems, had struck it rich in emeralds down in the green hell of Columbia. Old and dying and without kith nor kin, he'd suddenly appeared out of the wild Colombian jungles and was taken to the little missionary hospital in the town of Socorro. On his deathbed, he turned over his worldly goods and possessions to Dr. Sanchez. Doc, I ain't got nothing in the world but this bag of emeralds. Here it is. But uh, these emeralds? Why, these emeralds are very valuable, Joe. I know it, Doc, I know it. You ain't telling me nothing I don't know. Now you listen to me. Yes, Joe, excuse me for interrupting. You want a bigger hospital, don't you? Yes, of course. We need it very badly. The natives... Well, you're going to get it if old Joe Marks has his way. Now, listen to me, Doc. My time's running out. I don't want to palaver more than I have to. I'm going to give you the emeralds. Then you can have a fine hospital. Give me the emeralds? Why, Why, they're worth a fortune. Of course they are. That's why I'm giving them to you, blasted. But there's a catch, Doc. A catch? Yes. What is it, Joe? I've I've made out a will. It's here in this envelope. I want you to see that it gets to the States for me. It's addressed to a lawyer. His name is O'Connell. John something or other O'Connell. Francis. Yes, that's it. John Francis O'Connell. He's a probate lawyer, I guess they call him. Well, I want him to get this letter and my will. Now then, Doc, is it a deal? Is it a deal? Why, Joe, for what you've done for our hospital, I'll deliver the letter in person. Yes, sir, I'll I'll fly to the States and deliver your last will and testament personally. No, no, you don't. I ain't dead yet. Them things ain't to go to no one till I kick the bucket. But don't look so sad, Doc. I ain't gonna last much longer. Just take good care of me for a few more days, and then, then the bag of emeralds is yours. Yes, sir, Doc. Yours for keeps. <laughs> That's how the whole matter had its start. 
Old Joe Mark stayed alive just two weeks longer, and then he died, just as he expected he would. Dr. Sanchez lost no time in catching a plane for a trip to the States. He'd already decided to name his new hospital the Joe Marks Memorial. He came up to my office to deliver the last will of the deceased prospector. Well, now, Mr. O'Connell, that's the whole story. You have the letter and the will. As you'll see, I and uh, one of the nurses signed as subscribing witnesses to the will. The beneficiary under the will is a resident of the United States. Joe told me he didn't know her, but he liked her looks. He saw her picture in a magazine. Mm, perhaps I'd better open the envelope and see if everything's in order. Yes, please do. Hmm. Good heavens. Why, it's incredible. This Joe Marks has left his entire emerald mine to Patsy Bubbles Moran. And who might I ask is she? Patsy Bubbles Moran is America's number one pinup girl. She's the queen of burlesque. <laughs> I phoned Miss Moran and invited her up to my office to inform her of the good news. She an emerald mine. She. Now all I have to do is go down and pick up the emeralds. Isn't that what you said, Mr. O'Connell? <laughs> well, in theory, yes, Miss Moran. Of course, the emeralds won't be quite that easy to get. I understand that the mine is several hundred miles in the interior, that you have to go through miles of uncharted jungle, that in the jungle live a band of headhunters. And outside of a few boa constrictors climbing over a few ranges of the Andes Mountains, maybe a few wild animals fording a dozen or so rivers, well, <laughs> yes, then the emeralds are practically yours to pick up. Oh, gee, Mr. O'Connell. <laughs> emeralds come high, don't they? <laughs> Did you ever see the green flame that comes with them? Dark green fire. Fire that no girl can resist. Sort of like a person's soul. I agree with what you say. I only want to warn you of the attendant dangers. Of course, you might be able to hire someone down in Columbia oh, to go Oh, and... no. Why put temptation like that in someone's way? <laughs> if there's any emeralds in Mr. Joe Mark's mine, I want to be there when they're picked. <laughs> well, if half of what I hear is true, you ought to be a very wealthy girl before you're through. Oh, that doesn't interest me at all. Can't you see what old Joe Marks has left me? He gave me a chance for adventure, excitement, something new. Yes, something that can take me off the magazine covers and let me be myself for the first time in five years. That means more than emeralds or money, Mr. O'Connell. Good heavens, what a strange girl you are. I never would have suspected. Men never do, Mr. O'Connell. They only surmise. Between us, they do that badly. <laughs> I finally agreed to fly down to Columbia with Miss Moran and help her organize an expedition that would carry her into the interior. Fortunately, an old mining engineer friend of mine, Steve Murphy, was in Columbia, and I cabled him to tell him of my plans. He agreed to meet us at the airport. It's murder to let a girl go into the interior, John. It's bad enough for us. You can't imagine what goes on. Why, some of those Indian tribes would rather snatch your head than have a million emeralds. And you know what they do? They shrink them, make mm -hmm. them real small and pretty. Oh, you mean... I mean more than that. You can still recognize the person, even though his head isn't any larger than a tennis ball. I've already told Miss Moran about the dangers, Steve. And if that doesn't scare you, listen to this. Other tribes bump you off with poisoned arrows that they shoot out of blowguns. You don't hear anything. You feel a little sting, and eight seconds later they bury you. It's that deadly. Now are you convinced, Miss Moran? Oh, you forget, Mr. Murphy, that I've spent the last five years dancing in burlesque. <laughs> I've had everything thrown at me that's possible. <laughs> well, I survived. But what's a little jungle or headhunters or poisoned arrows by comparison? Okay, if that's what you want, I'm willing to do my best to take you in and bring you out all in one piece. I'll get busy and get men and equipment lined up for the trip. According to the map old Joe left you, we ought to be back in six weeks. And, if we're lucky, with a bag full of emeralds. Uh, you'll go, too, of course, won't you, John? Well, uh, you want me to go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, no, Steve, I'm a very busy man. Six weeks in the jungles with headhunters and poisoned arrows and what have you. 
No, I'll uh, just take a rain check. Uh, it's more than just going into the jungle, John. There's something else. I suppose you're catching panthers for Frank Buck. <laughs> <laughs> no, that'd be child's play alongside of the real reason I'm down there. The truth is, I want to trace the source of the very poison that these natives use on their arrows and darts. It's called curare. And why does anyone want to trace the source of a poison that kills you in eight seconds? Well, I'll tell you. Medical science has learned that this same poison, this curare, may possibly be the cure for polio malitis, what we call infantile paralysis. Yeah, I see. I see. I remember now that I read just recently that children were apparently completely cured and without any physical handicaps remaining. So that's it, Steve. Yes, that's it. I've got a good idea where this common jungle weed grows. In fact, it's right on the way to the emerald mine. We, um, we could kill two birds with one stone, and you could be a lot of help, John. Well, after you put it that way, of course I'll go with you, Steve. When do we start? Getting ready for our trip into the interior consumed the better part of the next few days. There were endless supplies to purchase, and last but not least, the choosing of picked natives who were to act as our guide through the uncharted miles ahead. In the last minute move, Steve had asked his handsome young son, Peter, to accompany us. One look at the curvaceous Patsy Moran, and he had eagerly acquiesced. After all, it wasn't every day that one took jungle trips with beautiful girls, and especially one so beautiful as our Queen of Burlesque. Finally, one night, Steve called us all together for a final meeting. Well, everything's set for an early takeoff at dawn tomorrow. We have four natives going along who'll act as guides, but they're unpredictable. When we reach the headhunter's territory, we white people must stay close together. At no time do I want any one of us separated. Now, remember that. It's vitally important. No one of us is ever to be alone. Well, Steve, I don't want you to worry too much about me just because I'm a girl. Believe me, I can take care of myself. I've done a pretty good job of it for five years, and it's for handling a gun. Well, I was born in Kansas, and I can knock off a pheasant with a twenty-two at 50 paces. Well, that's fine, but meanwhile, my son Peter here will keep an eye on you, too. You bet. It's going to be a lot more fun than running a copper mine, Dad. Mm. Well, now remember this, everybody. It's going to be dangerous. Pete, you are going to be responsible for Patsy's safety, and I'll take care of John. He's never seen a jungle either. And we've got to make the grade for several very important reasons. Oh, don't worry, Steve. I'm not at all frightened. In fact, I can't wait until tomorrow to get started. Yes? What is it, Tulu? Listen, boss, man. To sound coming from jungle. Mm. You hear? Yes, Tulu. The drums are beating. What does it mean? You are a tribe out to find new heads. They dance first. Oh, how horrible. Oh, luckily, these Hivaros fear the white man's guns and leave him strictly alone. It's only in cases that they are uh, caught alone that uh, trouble starts. That's why I said before, not one of us shall ever be alone under any condition. That's for our own personal safety. Oh, Pete, I'm going to handcuff you right to my wrist. I could think of worse things, Patsy. It's a deal. Tulu, tell the guides that we will leave at dawn and to have everything ready. Yes, postman. We ought to reach the Havaro territory just about the time they put on their ceremonial dance of victory. And if we do, well, I promise you a sight you'll never forget. Part two of Emeralds Come High will follow in just a moment. But first, a word from your announcer.
part two of Emeralds Come High with Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. We left Socorro before dawn and 20 minutes were deep in the tangled jungle. Only the chatter of monkeys and the strange tropical birds marred the quiet of the morning. Their incessant noise was terrifying to our native guides ahead. We pushed on into the green hell that completely swallowed us. Two days later... The natives have spotted us. They're telegraphing the jungle that we're coming. You're not frightened, are you, Patsy? Of course not. Neither. They're just another batch of wolves. I know how to handle them. If they ever spot that bright red hair of yours... Red means danger in anybody's language. Especially the red hair of Patsy Moran. Just let them try anything. Who's Peter, Steve? Up ahead with Tulu. The drums are getting nearer. They may be planning an attack. Keep on the trail. Look at those clouds. Looks like a storm coming up. Yeah, nothing new about that. They have one almost every day in these parts. I'd better go ahead and see what Tulu says about those drums. Hurry back, Steve. I can't even see the sky. Looks like a green heaven to me. That's all we need now, a thunderstorm. At least it would cool us off. Must be 150. Here it comes. Let's get under this leafy tree. Gosh, how dark it's getting. Hey! Hey up there, Steve! Pete! They can't hear me over the thunder. I'll run ahead and tell them to stop. Stay right here. I'll be right back. Okay. Now don't move, remember? I promise I won't move a step. Steve! Oh, Steve! Rain, rain, go away. Come again another... Ooh. Ah! Patsy! Where are you? Patsy Moran had disappeared as completely as though the jungle had swallowed her up. We searched everywhere, but not a single clue could we find. Steve, Peter, and I were forced to the conclusion that she'd been captured by the headhunters. As soon as the storm abated, we decided to increase the perimeter of our search. By twos, we spread out in an ever-widening circle. A little later... Bossman! Bossman, come! That's Tulu. Come. That's Tulu. He must have found something. Let's hurry. Coming, Tulu. See, Bossman? One tree. Tulu find hair. Red hair. Hey, that belongs to Patsy, all right. Now let's look around and try to find some more. We can trail her right to their village if we're lucky. Here's another one over here. Looks as though Patsy is deliberately letting her hair get caught in the underbrush. She's showing us the way. Drums beat closer. We're getting closer to their encampment now. Be careful where you step. We can't let them hear us. Shh. Look. Over here between these bushes. That's the village, all right. What's going on? I can't see. Looks like they're having their ceremonial dance. All of the Hibaro tribe are sitting in a semicircle. Someone must be dancing. See how they keep swaying to the throb of the drums? That's their dance of victory. I hope that doesn't I don't think we're too late. They all dance around a new head. Now only one is dancing. I'll go up closer. Wait here. Hey, crawl over here. We can see everything. One at a time. You go first, John. Take a look, John. There's a sight to remember. Shades of Minsky. It's Patsy, and she's dancing. What a dance. Broadway never saw anything like that. We've got to let her know we're here. Wait. With all these birds raising bedlam around us, I think I can do it. What are you going to do? I'll give her the wolf whistle. <laughs> She'll recognize that. She didn't hear you. Do it again. She heard it. Hey, she's giving us a message. Heard you, heard you. Dancing too. Save my head. They want to make me their queen. Come back tonight. Later that night, under a brilliant tropical moon, we crept back to our place in the jungle just outside the native village. We had everything ready for a quick getaway, but we were prepared to get Patsy one way or another. Most of them are drunk. They get tight on some native brew and sleep for days. 
Hey, look way over there. That hut on the far side. Yes, I see. Patsy is crawling out of the hut. She's cutting into the jungle. Give her that wolf whistle, John. Let her know we're here. Now let's wait. There she is. Over here, Patsy. Here. Steve. Oh, John. Gee, it's like old home week at the Follies. And what a relief to see your red hair still attached to your pretty head, Patsy. Oh, yeah, but yeah. let's go, let's go. Every minute we stay here may be our last. We'll strike right out to the mountain pass. Once we're there, we'll be safe. Oh, wait just a minute. There's something I want to show you first. I can wait. No, no, it can't. Now you boys follow me. I know just where to go. Here. Take a look. Well, it's a huge meadow with a good crop of weeds. What's so different about it, Patsy? I saw the Indian women gathering those weeds this afternoon. They blew it in huge kettles, and then they dipped their arrows and darts in it. The curare weed. Good heavens, there's enough there for every clinic in the world. But how can we get it out? Why, it's all... it would mean war. <laughs> you boys leave that to me. I know how. Well, tell us, Patsy. I told you that these natives want to make me their queen. They think red hair is a sign of divinity. <laughs> So I'm going to stay on and be their queen until you lugs come back with a mule train large enough to take this entire crop of curare. Patsy, you're out of your head. Do you think I'm going to... Oh, thank you for them kind words, Peter. But what we're doing is a lot more important than we are. Now, Steve, listen. I'll be perfectly safe right here. While you boys are hot-footing it back to Socorro, I'll be busy learning these native dances. I found out that they put more bumps in their dances than I do. And that's saying something, believe me. But, uh, Patsy, even if everything is as you say... How are we going to get the Kurari weed out of here without a battle? Well, if I'm to be their queen, they'll have to mine Mama. And I expect you to bring back enough trinkets to keep their minds off their loss. Now hurry, it's getting near dawn. We've got a week's journey. John, Patsy's is right. I think she's perfectly safe for a few days, and the risk is worth it. Come on, we'll head back to Socorro. Goodbye, boys. Goodbye. Good luck. Goodbye, Patsy. I... I'll miss you. I'll miss you too, Pete. Just wait until you see my next dance. Mm, strictly from the jungle. <laughs> Six days later, our convoy of seven pack mules and our band of 15 men, led by Dr. Sanchez, returned to the outskirts of the native village. We stopped to reconnoiter just in case. There she is. Look. Good heavens, they've got her sitting on a throne. Two men are fanning her with banana palms. She really is a queen. John, give her the signal. <whistles> hey, look, she knows we're here. She hears us. The hey, drummers are running for their drums. The natives are lining up in two rows. Patsy's getting down from the throne. She's walking between the rows of men. She's heading out here to us. She's done it. They're going to welcome us. There's royalty if I ever saw it. We've got all the curare weed cut, Steve. It's all loaded and ready for the return trip. Oh, that's fine, Doctor. Tell the men to start back. We'll stay and say goodbye to the chief. I hope they let their queen go without any trouble. I'm sure they will. She told them she was going back to the sky one day. Look, Steve. The natives are all gathering in the center of their village. Drummers are coming out. What's going on? Uh, our Patsy is going to give them her final dance. Ooh. Yeah, she told me it'd be a fire dance so that they could all think she's going back to the sky in a cloud of fire. <laughs> Let's join the natives and watch. This ought to be good. <laughs> now, let's sit right here, behind them, just in case. Yeah, that's a good idea, son. Hey, it almost looks as though the pagan gods were taking a hand in this. Look up at the sky. Another one of our daily cloudbursts in the offing. Well, I'm used to them. She's starting her dance. There, in the midst of those headhunters, we saw a wild, barbarous jungle dance that defies description. The incessant pounding of those jungle drums set our blood aflame. And with the thunder crashing all around us, Patsy held us spellbound. It was a savage dance of rhythm and movement that blended into the wild surroundings of the jungle. Suddenly, a vicious bolt of lightning struck. Where's Patsy? She's gone. Quiet, John. Quiet. That's what she was waiting for. That was her cue for a timely exit.
Back in Socorro, we learned why Patsy had suddenly abandoned her search for the Emerald Mine. Well, you see, boys, in my fire dance, I carried the map in my pocket. I had to do quite a bit of disrobing. Well, Patsy, you mean you... Yes, the map is still with the rest of my clothes in the native village. But don't worry. I told him I'd come back someday. And I know the old chief will never destroy either my clothes or the map. We'll get them on the next trip. Won't we, Peter? Well, Peter, next trip. Why are you two going... Well, to... Dad, you see, uh, it's this way. Yes, son, I'm listening. Well, Patsy and I are... Well, we're, we're going to fly to the States. For our honeymoon. Honeymoon? Mm-hmm. And then we're coming back and go to work. In between having our babies, Pete and I are going to sort of gather emeralds while we may. <laughs> Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you the rest of the story of the probate cause of Emeralds Come High. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. News of Patsy Moran's strange adventure with the headhunters preceded us to the States. And what happened? <laughs> She's being billed as the Emerald Queen. I don't have to tell you that her native jungle dances are causing a sensation that won't be forgotten on Broadway in a long time to come. I'd certainly like to be back in Colombia when the Queen returns to her tribe. That'll be a day to remember. And I'd like to pick up a few emeralds here and there if, if and when they may be found. Wouldn't you? Next week, I'm going to tell you the story of a violin. Back in 1732, Antonio Stradivarius, the world-celebrated violin maker, created an instrument that was so perfect sounded so beautiful that he gave it the name of a beautiful girl. Down through the years, that violin has had experiences that have made a story so poignant, so beautiful, as was ever written. We call this unusual story Emily. This is Warren William, inviting you to listen again next week. <laughs> Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Robert Webster Light. Names, places, and events have been changed so that no reflection may fall on any person or persons living or dead. This is a Teloways feature produced in Hollywood. <laughs>